be open to criticism. You cannot get your feelings hurt. You can't. And you you have to understand that criticism of what you're doing on position, especially when you start working live traffic, is not to belittle you. It's not to demean you. It's to help make you better. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 6 to 8, Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on Live ATC. Good day. November 643, Juliet Mike, third visual truck from Way 23 Live, Conic Tower. November 3222, Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 and miles. Uh, 3047, Charlie, try a departure, let our contact climb and maintain. November 747, Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk to your fire, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. Charlie to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special. Charlie VFR Fox, Golf Fox, Fox Tron Alpha, this is Triad Approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, March 20th, 2023, episode 272. On today's show, we'll talk about why not all facilities can run traffic as tightly as others. You're the nicest controller on the West Coast and answer more of your awesome aviation questions and feedback. What's up, Beijing? Hello. <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. This is getting off to a swimming start. Yeah, we are. <laughs> We're struggling. We're off our game. It's a weird time. It's a weird time. There's other people in the house. We're both having a beverage. I haven't had any of mine yet. Mm, I've only had a couple sips. I talk slow enough as it is. I think I mm. think I might wait till the end. If you do want to kick up the comedic value of the show, play us at half speed, not 1.5, 0.5. 0.5 speed, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> you got to work some overtime today. Yeah. How was that? Well, considering I had the mid the day before... So today's Saturday on yeah, Thursday so, night. Yep, Thursday night to Friday morning. Mm-hmm. I had the mid, so I got off work at six in the morning, Friday. I came home. I took a what could be considered a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I slept during the day uh, for a couple hours, and then I was up, and then. Uh, Saturday, I had to be back to work at 6 a.m. Mm, it's awful. Is it so, busy? Um, not really. Uh, moderately. I was told it was a normal, pretty normal Saturday. Like around 10 a.m. it started picking up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much it. 9.30, 10 o'clock. Uh, when people finally start... You know, mm-hmm. getting themselves to the airport. Uh, I only worked traffic one time. I was otherwise on the desk. Mm. We trained a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Well, welcome to Saturday night. We are recording out of whack this week because I'm going out of town for two months. Well, really two Mondays. This is the beginning of a weird schedule. Yes. We will release this episode on Monday, and the one we record on Monday will release the following week. I will be going to Sun and Fun to work, airplanes, all week. If you're down there and you're around on Friday, I'm off on Friday. I'm trying to figure out a way to say hello to anybody that wants to say hello. 
but I don't know anything about Sun and Fun, so it'll be easier said than done when I get down there and get the read on everything. So, so you're not living in a tent? Mm-mm. Huh. We are being transported from a hotel Oh. at a secure location. <laughs> <laughs> no tent. An undisclosed secure location. Uh, the chat room, Bravo Kilo did ask if I started studying. Yes, I have. And you know what is a good place to study and, and get familiar with some of this stuff? YouTube. Oh, yeah. You can watch the procedure and how it unfolds from an airplane. And <clears throat> yeah, hmm. I started doing that. It's helping. It is much different. Well, not that the overall concept is close to air venture. Place airplanes on an arrival in one spot where they can organize themselves into a line. Now, the one video I did watch wasn't <clears throat> wasn't a lot of traffic. It might have been in the middle of the day. I'm not sure, but it wasn't a big rush. So sequencing was not an issue, but you can get the idea of the path and hear air traffic and how they do it. So okay. they do the, they they do similar communication. <laughs> rock your wings. Have all your lights on. Certain speed. Certain altitude. Fly over this landmark, aim at this one. We'll tell you what to do from there. So. Okay. But yeah, looking forward to it. Cool. Shall we begin? All right. All right. Ready. Since OB271, we have a ton of new patrons. Sierra Echo, Juliet Foxtrot, Juliet Uniform, and Juliet Sierra are new in the show listener tier. I'm turning this down. Tango Sierra, Tango Whiskey, and Charlie Delta are new in the show supporter tier. And we have a new showmaker, Juliet. Juliet's here up from the show listener tier. Thank you. Patrons get exclusive access to our live stream recording each week on YouTube, occasional bonus content, and are part of the coolest ATC fans in the ass. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing bases. And after the show, I believe we have one review left. Leave us a review and a five-star rating. Hit subscribe or follow in your podcast player so our episodes are waiting for you each week thank you everybody thank you reviews and announcements reviews and announcements <laughs> uh your choice there's mm. an announcement it's you talk about it it's your it's your project okay <laughs> hold on I got the wrong <laughs> banner. There we go. AG, that's me. <laughs> uh, just finished episode four of our video series on our flights to Oshkosh. Um, there will be more. The next one, which I will start working on sh uh, shortly, will be the uh, flyway through Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um and the views of downtown as we go right by downtown. Um, Number four are... was, was awesome. You did a really good job on that. Oh, thank you. Um, so that is that is the new computer, new editing software, um, and slowly trying to learn that. It's a huge program. Uh, it's fairly complicated sometimes. So anyway, um, it would make me feel a lot better if you went and watched that. <laughs> If you're a patron, it's only available to patrons. Mm -hmm. uh, so go check that out. All right. Uh, I look forward to number five. You want me to get the review? All right. From Logan's 1211. Five stars. Fantastic aviation podcast. Great humor. Love it. I've been listening to RH and AG for a few months. Hopefully other things too. <laughs> I make sure to catch every week. I'm about to start my instrument training. Written already passed. Congrats. And this is definitely a huge help. My girlfriend, while she thinks the show is astoundingly boring. <laughs> what? Has come to admit it's tolerable. Okay. okay. And sometimes understands what is being mentioned. Although penguins and icebergs confuse her. Filled with humor. Surely only pilots will even understand. And great advice from current controllers. You'd be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't listen to these guys. Keep it up. Excited to see what's to come. Thanks, Lima Sierra. Cool. All right. To the girlfriend of <laughs> Lima Sierra. <laughs> a 
few months. It's not enough as a non uh, pilot. If that's what you are, uh, it takes a little bit more time. So hang in there and pretty soon you'll be, you'll be in the chat room during the show on live shows. So just hang in there with us. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, we are going to do a Charlie off segment. Oh boy. Let me try it from this button here. I'm going to try this. I, th I think I put this in here. I did. Starts off a little bit slow. All right. We are going to do a Charlie Alpha segment tonight. We got a message and some pictures on the following screen. Can you see those? I can. Okay. Um, do you want to read this or do you want me to start it? Uh, you go ahead. Okay. From Charlie Alpha. I've been meaning to share this for ages. Probably a bit hard to share with others without all the explanations, but I thought you might appreciate it. All right. What she sent was a picture of, it looks like a five foot stack of computers from probably the mid eighties. <laughs> At best. <laughs> I thought you might appreciate how the CVR cockpit voice recorder downloads were done back in the day. Our day. FML. <laughs> Pretty much like trying to record a tape. From a tape. Did you yeah, ever do that? Yeah, there's reel to reel. Oh, yeah. The quality <laughs> goes down exponentially. <laughs> oh, it's in half each time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so by the time you get to the third version, there's nothing left. <laughs> Just hear uh, dust. You hear the yes. dust going by. On the... uh, she continues, we still have this down in the lab in case we need to listen to anything from the Ice Age or assist with international requests from countries while operating planes from the 1800s. <laughs> Cheers, Charlie Alpha. I'm going to share the screen in a second. All right. I asked how it was today if the CVRs are kind of read with, you know, downloaded onto a thumb drive and turned into a wave file or MP3. Uh, yes, kind of. There's a bit more to it, but pretty much for intact flight data recorders, which most are, you can just plug it straight into the computer through an Ethernet port or a USB. You don't even have to says you do have to apply different algorithms to convert the binary data to engineering units for the different parameters you're looking at, which will vary depending on the aircraft type. And then you have to convert that into software so you can plot it or create. All right, back in the 60s and 70s, the magnetic tape on the loop used to record five parameters. By the 80s and 90s, it got up to 11. But today, recording on a solid state memory chip, they can record thousands and thousands. Let me, re let me put this up on the screen here. Thousands and thousands of parameters. So, okay, let's go back. Five parameters. What are we talking? Like flight path of the plane? Mm-hmm. Okay, so pitch, pitch, roll, yaw, plus mm -hmm. thrust, maybe. Mm -hmm. Airspeed. Uh, altitude, airspeed, altitude. I, I don't know. So then you just start adding more and more and more. Thousands and thousands. What would be thousands? Probably uh, different like throttle settings where they are in relation to the full throttle, uh, maybe engine readouts. Where every button is. Yeah. Yeah. Every button's position. Oh. Um, every input on those different buttons, probably. That is not unlike the radar scope. Uh, they, they record everything. Where the cursor was. Right. Everything. So. All right, so we're looking at the stack here with, <laughs> I don't know what one of these boxes. It does look like a magnetic tape reader on one side. I do see your reel-to-reels on okay. both sides, yeah. Okay, and some sort of uh, super high-tech little screen at the top there. Yeah. Wires hanging everywhere and probably a manual stuffed in there somewhere holding up one of the sides. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to scroll down. These look like current. I can smell the 1960s on this stuff. <laughs> you could just smell it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure some of this uh, was borrowed from the flight guidance system of the Saturn V. <laughs> pretty <laughs> The two bottom pictures are more modern units that can be plugged in solid state drives and probably read infinite more data than than the old old ones used to. So yeah, that th that one on the left probably is the entire. This entire unit combined into a something that fits in the palm of your hand. How big do you think that is? We're we looking at like a bottom of a Coke can or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, maybe a little bigger, not much. Hmm. 
Charlie Alpha is in the chat room. Maybe at the end of today's show, you can come in and, and live and talk about that. How about that? I Think like about that. it. It's right. morning. It's morning over there. So it's morning, very early. All right. Um, I need to go back to my notes. I turn that off. All right. Moving on. Timely feedback. Timely feedback. All right, we got a couple audios in here. They're all from SGAX today. Oh. Today's timely feedback is all SGAC patrons. The first one from SGAC patron Charlie Mike sent some audio. Hello, RH and AG. Charlie Mike from the Frozen North. Long time no feedback. I was recently training a new CF double I. And we were looking in part 91 for the regulation that says you must maintain your assigned altitude within 300 feet. It's what leads to the brasher warnings and the possible pilot deviations when you are uh, floundering around the sky. We can't find it. There's nothing in part 91 that says a pilot must maintain within 300 feet. There's only a section that says we must maintain compliance with ATC instructions. There's something in the 7110 that says uh, controllers must warm when you're off by 300 feet or the pilot controller glossary. Why isn't it in part 91? Or are we missing something after hours of looking? Thanks. Thank you, Charlie Mike. All right. This is much simpler than I think you guys are giving it credit for. You're not allowed to be off on your altitude at all. Right. <laughs> If you get an altitude assignment, that's the one you should be at, not 300 feet below or above. The 300 feet that you're confusing this with as a reg is how, and I always mess this up, it's more than 300 feet off. We can no longer use that data, right? Yeah, so if your mode C readout is off of what it should be. Then we is... will say, hey, your mode C is terrible. Do something, push buttons, reset it, come back. It's not working. And if it doesn't work, we're going to tell you to stop because presumably you're flying at the altitude we gave you based on your altimeter, and we're just getting bad data from your transponder. That, so we turn right, and and we turn that off. We say stop because it's super confusing. Yes, that should not be confused with the. Uh, authorization to fly 300 feet off it may be the first time you hear something but if there's targets merging and they were both assigned altitudes that are a thousand feet apart and one of them is off we're going to say something because the system doesn't like it we're going to have a deal <laughs> we're having a deal <laughs> it's that's what it thinks we're having a deal <laughs> so <laughs> uh yeah we're gonna we have a, a vested interest in either turning that off and putting our own altitude in there Mm -hmm. um, or making sure that you are at that assigned altitude. What you should not do ever is, let's say your altimeter says 3,000, and the controller says, I show you at 3,300. What you should not do is descend to 2,700. Please don't do that. <laughs> so that we see 3,000. That is not, no. You just need to fix whatever the problem is, <laughs> and stay at three and then we'll just so in uh in your data block if you stop altitude squawk which is what so you'll probably be asked to do uh, we can then manually input an altitude into your data block and then every time uh, we assigned a new altitude we would just change it in there manually so and we would probably ask you to report your altitude frequently yes but let's repeat, that is not authorization to fly 300 feet off. No. You're authorized to fly no feet off. <laughs> <laughs> Plus or minus zero. Yeah. Now, don't confuse that with practical test standards in a check ride where there may be some allowances. That That's not the same. We may not notice until you've already gone over a few hundred feet or say anything, but that does not mean it's a green light to do that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're getting asked, it's probably because something is, you know, you would be a conflict if you mm -hmm. weren't at the right altitude. I think it's funny. Sometimes you say, say altitude, altimeter, and magically 
there's compliance. Yeah, weird, huh? <laughs> so weird. <laughs> yeah, I show you at 2,800. No, 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 no. Where? I no, try not to put that on there unless I'm about to have merging targets where my controlling is going to be put into question. So before right. that, verify altitude. That's your chance to fix it. Right. Has to be the one we gave you. I will explain to the pilot, listen, you are merging with someone a thousand feet above you. Mm -hmm. I need you to be at 3000 feet. You must be there. So anyway, you want to get number two, number two from SCAC patron Sierra Echo. Hello there. I was trying to depart from one of the several uncontrolled deltas in the Hollywood Vacation Valley of Choice, looking for a clearance from the Overline SoCal controller, this poor guy was absolutely saturated. It was a Sunday morning, so I'm guessing several sectors were combined. I finally squeezed in my request for a clearance, and using phraseology right out of the 7110, the controller said, aircraft, <laughs> aircraft looking for a clearance. You're simply going to have to look elsewhere. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow that's new i have not heard that mm -mm. one it seems polite though at least they were nice yeah yeah maybe sort of mm -hmm. okay then i'll look elsewhere i called the corresponding socal data position on the phone and they took care of me i still needed to go back to the original controller for the release and he squeezed me in all good the controller was doing an amazing job more than he should have had to do on a sunday morning Regards, Sierra Echo. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. You're going to have to look elsewhere. <laughs> when that happens in our room, sometimes we'll ask the middle person, whoever's on the desk or the data, to, hey, and I'm going to come off those frequencies. Please give this. Somebody's looking for a clearance. I don't have time. Yeah. It's incredibly distracting at some of the most inopportune times or someone's in your ear. Looking for a clearance. Not you didn't do anything wrong asking for it. You did the right thing. You got a phone number. So you're probably getting the same person in that room that could have also picked up the frequency, but maybe that's not normal in other facilities. Switching your brain from I'm working like 15 airplanes <clears throat> to I'm going to stop doing all that for like 30 seconds at least to read a clearance and get a read back. <laughs> like you feel like the world is going to end. Because you are falling behind and behind and behind and behind. Mm -hmm. So I get it. Uh, when you're covered up, that's a hard thing to do, to read a clearance of somebody on the ground. Um, but good for the controller for recognizing that, because you can stop that introduction of somebody new to your problem. And you're on the ground. You're not hurting anybody. And you're not bottom of priority and overall scheme of things, but it's not urgent that we get back to you right now. So Right. All right. So Thanks. oftentimes what I'll do as a hint to that person, so we have the ability to, mm -hmm. we're not always transmitting on that ground frequency at an uncontrolled airport. I'll just turn the transmitter on so the person that's calling me on the ground can hear me working all these other planes and understand, like, this is why I'm telling you to stand by because I'm busy. Right. That's cool. That's a cool story. I never heard that before. <laughs> Love the sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, do I get number three? All right. From SCAC patron India Mike. Now, you guys went back and forth a little bit about this audio. I cut it down. Are we good to play this based on your conversation? This was the nicest controller on the West Coast. Oh. I, th I think so. Why don't you look that up while I read the words? Okay. Hey, AG and RH, I just wanted to share this live ATC clip because I believe the compliment I received today was the direct result of what you guys have contributed to my understanding of ATC from the other side of the mic. Your show has really helped me be more aware of the issues that contribute to controller workload and how I can help to minimize my footprint as a pilot in order to get the services I need when I need them. Thank you for the fantastic show. India Mike, I believe you are in the chat room. Yeah. Green light on yeah. the audio. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's play that. I cut it down. It was it was a whole thirty minute. Uh, I got it down to a couple minutes of All fair right. interaction. So 
the facility is not bleeped out. No reason to. Mm. This is all good stuff. And the call signs are all there. So, all right. Mm, here it is. Camera Tower, Skyhawk, Niner 877, holding short, 26 uh, IFR. Skyhawk, Niner 877, Tango, Camera Tower, holding short, runway 26, waiting IFR release. Use caution for birds, multiple small, small birds south of the runway, first 2,000 feet at varying altitudes. Okay, we'll hold short, runway 26, Skyhawk, Niner 877, Tango, we'll dodge those little birds. Tower 7, I'm requesting early uh, right crossing. Seven Echo, Echo Hotel, early right cross on the bridge. Thank you. Commander 877 Tango, camera tower, use caution for a helicopter operating at the north pad, wind 210 at 6, runway 26, clear for takeoff. 26, clear for takeoff, Scott 9877. Cub 7 Echo Hotel, frequency change approved, have a good day. Good day, thanks for your help, bye bye. Contestant 7 7 Tango, I'm Eunice, sincerely, always a pleasure. Contact with me to watch her. Have a good day. Ah, uh, thanks a lot. Same. 7 7. Camera Tower 182011, Romeo we'll Papa, holding short 26, ready for departure. Romeo 2011, Romeo we'll Papa, Camera Tower, use caution for a helicopter operating at the north side. Additional traffic in the upland Cessna will be a slight right turnout. Wind 2306, then way 26, clear for takeoff. 26, cleared for takeoff. Thanks, Paige. It's Jackie! It's Jackie! When you want Romeo Papa? <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Hiya. Everybody's up today. It's SSA 72, contact point of your departure today. Okay, I'm on it. Thank you. It's SSA 72. Thank you, India Mike, for sending that in. Sounds like a controller who enjoys what they're doing. It does. And has a lot of friends on frequency. What a strange <laughs> concept. <laughs> <laughs> very nice and very nice. you can hear it in their tone a couple shows ago we talked about tone i don't know that i've ever sounded like that in my entire life no <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> all right moving on Let's put this into two parts here. There's a top paragraph and a bottom one. Two separate things. You pick. All right. Um, let's see. We're going to break down together the second part, but the first part is kind okay, of I'll, I'll start. Okay. This week's show topic is from is brought to you by patron Delta... Bravo, Charlie. Gentlemen, I wanted to thank you for the discussion regarding the math in deciding if the downwind guy can beat the straighting guy. It got me to the crew van much sooner yesterday. Ah. <laughs> as, <laughs> as we descended into the Capital River downwind somewhere over Raventown, the approach controller gave us a descent to 2,000. This is 500 feet lower than normal. Indeed, it's 500 feet below uh, the intermediate fix and 600 below the MSA. That's the minimum safe altitude on the approach plate. Uh, but not to be confused with the MVA, the minimum vectoring altitude, which air traffic can use, which is frequently below the altitudes listed on the plate. Anyway, the captain and I exchange a confused, this is new glance. Then for perhaps the very first time in my life, like Woody Harrelson in 1992 cinematic masterwork, <laughs> White Man Can't Jump, I fully understood the assignment rather than just hearing the instructions. The trust bond, <laughs> the trust bond, the controller had extended us would not be broken. And then disaster, <laughs> screaming along the east bank of the river as fast as the administrator sipping his... Sm Coffee mere feet below would allow. Some talkative Timmy started working. <laughs> <laughs> talkative Timmy is going to make frequent appearances on the show from now on. Yes. <laughs> he, started, he started working his soup cooler. <laughs> I've 
I've never heard your someone's mouth called a soup cooler before. <laughs> right as we came a beam, uh, the perfect base turn unfazed. Our controller added ten degrees <laughs> to our turn in a tone that Timmy could not have mistaken. It all worked out because I had listened to opposing bases only hours before and knew the controller needed us to keep our speed up when he would normally have started slowing us down. Hearing you talk about the math uh, that has to happen, I was impressed that our controller had identified that opening for us while we were still 40 miles on the departure side of the airport. I have always respected what you guys knew, but now I am truly impressed at how far ahead of the problem you really are. Our trust bond had turned into a mind meld, and I could feel the smug pride of a perfectly executed squeeze play come through as we exchanged thank yous in the handoff. Wow, what a great story. Mm -hmm. Well written, too. Talkative Timmy, talkative Timmy in his soup cooler will be (laughs) be frequent guests. (laughs) Ah, Fantastic. All right, this, as well as AG's recent field trip to J.R. Ewing Memorial Field, brought a question to mind. Why? <laughs> wow. We're going to explain this and defend this, so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Why are Metroplex controllers such massive chickens? Shots fired? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> it seems that the controllers at the current capital, Oriole Field, first capital, and Lesser Big Apple and Beantown are more than happy to feed their towers three-mile stew all day long. These towers controllers see that two-and-a-half to three-mile final as enough for two departures from crossing runways and a runway inspection. Meanwhile, at Metroplex, a literal 40-mile final is not uncommon, and getting within five miles is met with panicked calls to slow down. I couldn't resist the chance to poke fun at Metroplex, but the question is real. If it's safe to run traffic that tight in the Northeast, what about Metroplex makes it unsafe to do it there? Conversely, if it isn't safe, why do we do it in other places? Are we just dancing with the devil and crossing our fingers? It's a very common joke in the cockpit while waiting out yet another Metroplex edict, praying to all that's holy that the APU doesn't die to opine that we wish Metroplex controllers would take a field trip to see how it could be done. Lots of shots fired here. (laughs) AG made it sound like inter-facility tours are not only not common, but simply not a thing at all, that he had to call in a favor to see a different facility. Is this true even for facility supervisors? Thank you, Delta Bravo Charlie. All right. Uh, They pulled out questions for our convenience here. Is it safe to run finals and departures as close as they do in the north? What about Metroplex makes it unsafe? Is it just a margin of error because they have the space? And is there any kind of program for controllers, specifically supervisory controllers, to visit other facilities to foster an exchange of ideas, which might make everyone more efficient? All right. I'll answer the second question quickly. Typically, in general, bigger facilities that have that kind of traffic, the supervisors have experience somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's a very general statement. But it's unlikely that had they started as a controller, Somewhere, it's more likely they were started their career somewhere as a controller, went to that facility and became a supervisor at that facility. So they, they have an idea what it looks like somewhere else. Um, and I've seen that with managers, even at our facility. It, that helps. Um, but we're going to talk about today why sometimes that's not the magic solution. Exposure to other places isn't going to solve some of the things that are coming up. So, um, Let's start tackling these down here. My my defense of the Metroplex. Mm-hmm. I wanna, I'll open it with this. A long time ago, my dad asked me, he says, why does it take so long to train at another facility if you left Triad? I said, because you're starting over. It's totally different. Yeah. Unless all airports were the exact same and the airspace around them was the exact same and the rules with the adjacent facilities was the exact same, you have to relearn all that stuff. Anybody can keep airplanes apart. Yeah. It's learning how to follow the rules and the runway configurations for that place. So um, it, it's probably easy as a pilot to think, why is this airport so different? But I'm going to go back up to the top here while, before we tackle these. And I put it in blue. Um, all of the airports you mentioned, except for one, 
have a runway for arrivals and another separate pavement piece for departures that crosses or it's a parallel, but that makes all the difference. Right. Metroplex has that too, but they also land and depart on two of their runways, which makes a difference. Yes. You got to leave room. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect segue. Why don't you start that one here? So every, every airport is different. And even if maybe the runway layout was the same, there's always some, something different about each one. And I don't think any of them have the same runway layout. Mm -mm. Taxiway layout, high speed turnoffs, all of that stuff makes a difference. Like I said last week, I think last week, uh, an aircraft missing a high speed turnoff resulted in a go around. So at a place like ours that doesn't have a high speed turnoff, you know, you can't, even if we were allowed to run them two and a half in trail or they were doing visuals and they could see each other and they were two miles in trail and that was legal, you're not going to have time to get the guy off the runway. He has to be off the runway. So the runway configuration, the taxiway configuration, um, whether or not, like Ari said, are we sharing, are arrivals and departures sharing a runway? The news likes to act like this is like the <laughs> craziest thing that they could possibly think of. You know, like, oh my gosh, these, this plane was departing and another plane was going to land on, on the, the same, same pavement. What? Yeah. Newsflash, some airports only have one runway. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, so you got stuff like terrain. Like water, how far can we take a plane out over the water? You know, are we are we constrained by uh, mountains on one side, by an ocean on the other? Do we funnel? Are we bottleneck like Florida and like the Northeast mm-hmm. uh, in the New York area? Everything just sort of comes together all in one place. We can't. We're not going to fly into Canada. We're not going to fly out o- over the ocean. Um, so we kind of get bottlenecked into a into a place. Are there other busy airports around? You know, are we weaving traffic in, you know, from all these busy airports? You got to think there's departures and arrivals. Think about New York. Think about all the big places that are up there. Mm -hmm. And you've got departures and arrivals all happening all at the same time. It's crazy. It really is. Um I talked about the ground movement stuff, the crossing runways. So that's one of the things, and, and maybe you'll touch on this at Metroplex. Uh, when you are land on that west, uh, the far west runway, mm-hmm. this happened to me the last time I flew there. They have to have, if the planes are like three in trail to the center runway, you're not going to get across. Nope. You don't have time. Because nope. by the time that first plane lands... And they're going to go down past your intersection. Mm-hmm. And by the time they pass through your intersection, you're, there isn't enough room for you to cross in front of the next arrival. Right. So that's where some of that extra space is built in. They they give you five miles in trail so, so they can cross those planes or they, they start piling up. I mean, we were like eight deep mm-hmm. waiting to cross that center runway. Well, that's and I wanna, we'll bring that up here in a second, too, but we can talk about it now. When you're backed up to cross a runway, the arrivals to the runway that you landed on, there eventually you guys have to move. There's not enough room to just sit out there forever. So yeah. as things getting backed up, and for those of you who've been to Metroplex, one of the constraints they have is the setup of where the terminal is compared to the runways. If they're landing north, some of the airplanes get off almost at the end of the runway so that they can navigate around traffic that's leaving the terminal so they can get closer to their gate. There's high speeds before that, but that creates a gap issue. There has to be room for the next guy. They do launch on that runway, the, the east runway. They arrive and depart on it. Uh, that isn't the one in the middle that has to be crossed, but the location of the terminal and the sort of puzzle to get out of that terminal to one of the runways is part of that problem there. And 
my second big point here was at all these airports that we're talking about, they're probably maxed out on efficiency until they get another runway. There's nothing else they can do. Right. You need services to increase capacity at an airport. At, at some point you run out of room. They run out of room with runways spacing and taxing once they do get on the ground. Um, so the gaps that you guys are seeing and frustrated about, depending on which direction they're landing, there's a noise abatement issue that I did not mention in here, but at certain parts of the day, they have restrictions on how many arrivals they can take because of noise. They're limited to not all of their runways, put it that way. They can't land on all of them. Um, and that creates those TMU backups. TMU can lean over and tell the controllers how to share the spaces. They'll, they'll point to the, to the airplanes. They'll put the arrival runway for the feeder, it'll be populated by TMU. This is where you're putting this airplane. That may mean crossing the airport, but they're trying to evenly space them so that not only are, are both runways used, the arrival runways, but there's room for departures to come out because they're coming out. Right. They, they can't, they can't they say, <laughs> they have to. Yeah, they well, have their arrivals to have nowhere to go. Exactly. So, and that's a timing thing with the airlines and... I think the thing I said at the beginning, you have to go back to the fact that not having a dedicated arrival runway makes a huge difference. A huge difference there. Uh, you already mentioned the high-speed turnoffs. Uh, the east runway specifically, landing north. Oh, man. The way that's situated with the terminal, I'm going to try to pull this up on the screen, um, can create a, a backlog. There's, there's only so many places to hide on the ground. And that plays a, a role in how much space there has to be between departures. Or I'm sorry, between arrivals as well. So, um, did we touch on number four? You want to get that? I think it's two out of the three. So, they, the Metroplex arrives and departs on two uh, shared surfaces and crosses the other one, like we talked about, with arrival only traffic. So the gaps on that final have to be big enough to cross, launch a departure, and exit the runway. Which is why they start squawking, you know, at five miles, they need you to slow down because they got to have the room mm -hmm. to conduct those operations between arrivals. I have it up on the screen now. We're, okay. looking, we're looking north. Uh, the runway that you landed on and you waited in line to cross is the far left runway. You cross the middle one, the terminals between the middle one and the far right runway. And depending on what kind of bank is going on here, it looks like it's dead. It's Saturday night at eight. There's probably not a lot going on, just like our airport right now. Um, and we can't see ground movement, but you could see the position of that terminal. They have to get out of there and get to the departure runways. They have to create room for the arrivals to get into their gates. It's very tight space up there. That... If that terminal were moved, <laughs> it would probably make that airport an entirely different experience for everybody. Yeah. Uh, they also don't use that crossing runway anymore. They used two years ago uh, before they had the third parallel. Uh, that changed the dynamic of that airport. It's pretty much a taxiway at this point. I don't, I'm not sure they use it ever anymore. Do I they? don't think so. No. Um, so, I mean, neither one of us have worked there, but I think... The differentiating thing between the airports that you compared it to in the Northeast was a crossing runway is used for the opposite function, arrival or departure, and the proximity to gates and the way that airport flows, maybe in a pattern, to get you off of an arrival runway to a terminal and not really get in the way of anybody trying to get to a departure runway. That's also part of it. Yeah. The lesser New York, every departure, when they're departing, Oh, one three and arriving on two two. That's their most common configuration there. Every departure has to cross the arrival runway to get out. And then you go park over there in a parking lot. I'm pulling that up on the screen now. Um this corner over here in the in the upper left where everybody waits to go. They have to cross the arrival runway, which is where you see that Delta eleven eighteen landing right now. Okay. Uh, and the departures leave off of the crossing runway. They start up on the upper left. That's runway one, three. And they're locked into position. They're waiting for Delta to cross the intersection. And the the taxiways that feed that runway, all of them cross. 
the arrival runway. So there has to be a big enough gap there yeah. to get airplanes across. Yeah. And if you're up there enough, you realize that the, the timing of all that and the pacing. But um, there's a flow to that airport that's different. That's an entirely unique situation compared to the one you're talking about. I, I'm not going to pull up every airport that you mentioned in the feedback, but they all have their own advantages on how they can run traffic. And I think the bigger point is Metroplex is maxed out. <laughs> Until there's another surface put in, if there's ever going to be one, that's as good as it's going to get. That's it. Or they move the terminal. Oh, yeah. Or they get rid of all the unlit towers because the amount of time it takes the controllers to read all of those notams to the pilots, <laughs> you have to have <laughs> you have to have more space between the planes, or you just wouldn't have time to read them. <laughs> uh, the the controllers there are not chickens. There, we're defending them. <laughs> they're not no, chickens. no, they're not. You, I, I mean, really, you should look during a busy arrival bank. You should see the final there, especially on visuals. Uh, it's stuffed full of planes, very close together. Yeah. So, and that is another thing too that we didn't talk about. Their finals do stretch out pretty far. Speed is their friend. Um, because of that spacing that they have to have to make it work. Oh man. The, their finals do go out pretty far. Yeah. But I think their ground flow programs work. When you talked about an edict, you're waiting on the ground, you're hoping your APU doesn't break. All of our guys wait to leave. They're pretty much on the end of the arrival going in there from Triad. Uh, but that's the case probably for a few hundred miles outside of Metroplex waiting to go in there. You're going to have some sort of metered metered arrival. So, hmm. Did we defend our brothers and sisters from the Southwest? <laughs> well enough i think so uh, we you know we we give them a, a hard time but um, they do really good work there so yeah and i don't think any of those controllers are blind to the fact that there seems like there's a slow final there's larger gaps but it's kind of the hand they're dealt with the constraints they have and a lot of them have been to other airports oh if yeah you, if you take yeah. rectangular bravo in the south all the arrival runways are standalone the arrivals don't ever have to cross a runway, at least for two of them. They just go around the end now, right? Yep. So they never have to stop. Those two things there are humongous gains in efficiency. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, arrivals have their own runway, and they don't have to wait to cross. Yeah, they just exit get and, back. Go, and yep. go around. And they don't even call. They don't even call ground. Or if they do, it's just taxi via... That's it. It's just taxi via one taxiway to the ramp. Yep. Call us if you need to slow down because we need you to keep moving. Right. There's an expectation of pace. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas if you land at Metroplex, the odds of you going straight to your gate are pretty low. Yeah. You're going to stop somewhere. Yeah. Listen, so. if you're flying from Triad <laughs> to Metroplex and you think, oh, it's just a 20 minute flight. I won't worry about going to the bathroom. You made a bad decision. You need to go. You need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Not only will the the flow make that flight forty minutes, especially if they're landing north. Yes. If they're landing north, you're you're flying forever. Yeah. Just cancel your flight. <laughs> Just drive. <it. laughs> All right. Did we beat that horse? I think so. Thank you, Delta Bravo Charlie, for sending that in. All right, moving on. All right. Feedback time. Feedback. Uh, there are three of these. The third one is audio. Which one do you want? I'll do one. All right. From patron Alpha Juliet here. Greetings, sheiks of all spinny <laughs> things. Are there different... <laughs> Spacing requirements for aircraft in the terminal environment, like runway spacing and or out in the proverbial wild, <laughs> like the rest of the NAS after civil sunset, as opposed to before. Give a shout out to Romeo Juliet, my dad, for inspiring this question. P.S. I know this is ridiculously shorter than my normal writings. I will return to the accustomed short story length <laughs> for the next one. Later, Tato. <laughs> Tato. Tight. 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 Uh, <laughs> Alpha Juliet Zero. 
Uh, let's see. All right. Between sunrise and sunset. I know that's confusing. That's during the day. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I put that in there. No. Because when I see those words, I always think of nighttime. Even I, I know. No, I'm, I am, I'm not <laughs> joking. I'm being serious. Okay. <laughs> it is confusing when you're reading through the seventy one ten, and it's like between the hours of sunrise and sunset, or between the hours of sunset and sunrise. You always have to stop and go. Okay. All right. What time is it? Sunset. Why don't they just say nighttime and daytime? Yeah, during nighttime and daytime. Yeah, they can't. They have to define it. Imagine, imagine reading something where the definition, instead of actually just using the word, they always use the definition. Can you imagine how much longer <laughs> everything would be? Uh, anyway, uh, so during the day, we can use same runway separation standards uh, for Cat 1 and 2 airplanes, but not at night. Uh, they have to be off the runway. So uh, the... Same runway separation is predicated on the fact that you have visible markers, mm -hmm. something that you can see on the runway, a taxiway. Um, uh, sometimes you could see the thousand foot markers. I mean, you could just see them. So, you know, like, oh, that's the three, that's the four. And, mm -hmm. you know, you need 3,000, you need 4,500 for cat twos. So, like on our 9,000 foot runway, the taxiway in the middle is right at 4,500 feet. So that's a great marker at night. It's, it's not impossible to see where the plane is. I mean, you see them, but determine Sometimes it's hard to determine and depending on your angle to where they are, uh, it can be really tough, especially mm -hmm. down at the approach end of two, three left. Mm -hmm. And they, it's really hard to tell. It's hard to get a distance marker. So, uh, you're not allowed to do that at night. Um, the departure to departure is the same. It's the same day or night. So, yeah, and I think that's because there's a little bit less risk. Airplanes are moving away instead of slowing down. Con yeah, converging on each other. They're right. They're going apart. Departures mm -hmm. are, you know, and you're fanning the departures out. So if you're going to use six thousand feet in airborne. You're probably not going to be able to put them on the same heading. They need mm, to. No. <laughs> they need to be separated by divergence. And so you're reducing the risk even further there. Um, but arrival to arrival, one airplane is coming to a stop to exit the runway. Nearly and the a other stop. one is still airborne. And the other one is still flying at a rapid pace towards the, towards the stopping one. So I still think that even though it's legal, day or night, you're going to run into more pilots who are prone to go around, no matter what the size of the airplane was, unless the controller came out and specifically said, they are going to be on the runway, I, they're far enough down, please don't go around unless you need to for something else, but they are going to be on the runway. This happened to me Thursday. Okay. I had two small planes arriving. One was parking. They needed to exit way down the runway. Mm -hmm. He And I said, you know what? There's space. You got plenty of space. Continue down, turn right at Delta, mm -hmm. and contact ground. The other guy arriving, was not a like, jet, a cat two or one, just two Cherokees. Okay, uh, was clearly going to cross the threshold while this other plane was still there. And I said, "Hey, he's going to be on the runway. It's okay. I just need three thousand feet. That's all I need. And he's down. He's eight thousand feet down there." So it's okay. He's over a mile away. <laughs> you did, don't need did, to go around. Did they, they, they landed? Yeah, they landed. Yep. Oh, good. Do you think they would have, had you not said anything? I don't know. I just preempted it by saying something so that it didn't become a, a, a conversation. Hmm. I felt very proud of myself. <laughs> you should have been. <laughs> yeah. <There. laughs> I'll give you the crowd noise for that. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've only done that a couple of times total. Yeah. At Triad. We rarely have to do that. Yeah, it's very rare. Yeah. So, because they can usually get off the runway much sooner. So, cool. Thank you, Alpha Juliet Sierra. I get number two from patron Whiskey Charlie. Listening to your comments on the arrival and departure flows of Bravo versus Charlie Airports, I noticed something weird. 
At the no. Windy City Bravo, approaches are almost the same as what you explained at Triad. The SID, the uh, departure stops, departures at 5,000. If you have that in your altitude pre-select, did I tell that story live on the show? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I will later. Okay. Not seven, but five. Oh. The departures stop at five and the downwinds are at seven, usually with a descent to 4,000 after crossing a beam the field. Most arrivals have no specific altitudes. Departures climb on a runway assigned heading. It's always amazed me how smooth things flow given the lack of defined structure. You're often only on a tower assigned heading for a few moments before being given direct to whatever your initial fix may be. Why do you think that such a busy airport flows so well without any fixed points on the SID and could others be more like it? I wish more airspaces were that easy. Thank you, Whiskey Charlie. That is a very good question. Mm. I'm going to offer a couple of guesses. Why there's, and I I don't have it in front of me, but there are a very limited number of, of departures off that airport that are utilized if they do exist. The proximity to the northern boundary of our country might be one of them. Safe to say the traffic is either going east, west, or south. Right. So you're taking out one of the major directions. Their Pelo runways run east, west. So instead of having uh, departures that have to cross, maybe from a, a parallel runway from the south side of the airport and cut across, that sort of variable is taken out. That's one of the reasons I think that's happening up there. I don't have stats in front of me, but I'm going to guess that the volume has never required it. I never waited that long to take off up there. Right. I was always very quick to get off the ground. It's a busy airport. It's huge, but there's a lot of runways. And perhaps the concentration of departures and the timing of those departures doesn't need, you know, four different departure fixes for four different runways. We can aim them out on a runway heading, kind of treat them just like we do at Triad, which is what we do. We only have three departures, but and they're relatively simple. They all have the same headings off the airport, conflicting yeah. ones. Um, and we separate that way. I don't, I don't know. Do you have any other hypotheticals? It's, it, it, it isn't that. It, I mean, it's, it's like informal structure. It, there is structure. There's a way that, you know... A planes departing officer and runway are doing basically the same thing, you know, every time. And that's the same for us where there's not a very defined procedure, but we pretty much make it a procedure by the way we, you know, we work those planes. Um, there is some, there is some structure to it that we have imposed on ourselves, not through a procedure, but through the SOP or just through you know, standard practice and, and training the new people, you know, that are coming in, like this is just the way we do it. It's, and it makes it kind of predictable. Um, tower is required though, to have those planes unless otherwise coordinated on a prescribed heading. You're going to get the same headings off of Triad almost every time with few exceptions. Okay. I'll make, compare that to, let's pick a random rectangular Bravo from the South. Okay. Tons, tons of departures. They all, they're all RNAV. Most of them are RNAV departures. You, you have a, a, a pattern that you're leaving this airspace in. The departure controller, if there's no weather, is almost always going to be able to just say climb, maintain. Next time you hear them, is contact center. Right. Because your lateral path has been determined. They don't have the extra transmission of sending you to a fix, which you're going to get at Windy City Bravo, and they probably for the most part, have those climbs designed to be conformed with. They're not giving you impossible climb restrictions. So uh, they shouldn't have to say much. Whereas at Windy City, you may get a few more times on the radio and the volume may allow that. There may be enough of the departure controllers or a couple sectors set up where you're not costing that controller time and energy that they need to spend doing something else by giving you that instruction. And it, the, Simplest explanation is it isn't broken, so they're not going to fix it. They never added the departures right. or so many of them that they had to be so complex. Right. But you're right. That airport runs very smoothly and it's the, it's an old school SID. The one I remember up there, it's just 
VOR is everywhere. <laughs> you saw what, how it related to your position at, the, at that airport, but there was no defined lateral path. You just got the first fix on your flight plan. Right. Anything to add to that one? No. Thank you, Whiskey Charlie. All right, number three is audio from patron Whiskey Bravo. I'll let you talk on this in a second. Hello, Whiskey Bravo here, just outside the Salty Bravo. I've been making a good dent in the amount of episodes listened to and love the very informative content, especially for someone looking to go into ATC. I'll assume I'm going to school for ATC and would like to know if you have any advice for newbies. What training would help one do well on the test in Oklahoma? What skills help make a good controller? I really appreciate the great content. Have a good one, y'all. Thank you, Whiskey Bravo. Mm. That's uh that's a great question. Uh let me let me think about advice. Training as far as the test. I guess what I did was just they have practice tests. You can go and find them. Um I just did the practice test a few times sort of it orients you to what is on the test, the format that it's in, how everything kind of works. Um, and at least then when you do the test, it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to be on it. It's not specifically what's on it, but it, it gives you a good idea of what to be uh, prepared for. Uh, skills for a good controller. Oh, man. It's hard. They're hard. These are hard skills to sort of quantify. Confidence could not be understated. I just can't say enough about that. You have to have some confidence. You have to be, even if you might not feel confident, you at least have to be able to sound confident because the frequency would, will deteriorate hmm. out of your control. It, it really will. It is like, it's like blood in the water and it's nothing against the pilots. It's just sort of naturally what happens. But as I, I feel like as soon as pilots start to sense that the controller doesn't know or isn't confident in what's happening, the pilots will start to try, they will begin to attempt to run the scenario. Um, and you don't want that. You don't want the controller to become reactionary. I can't, there's no way to teach that. Mm -mm. There's no way to teach it. You just have to be it. Um, uh, what? I'll add something to that. The confidence isn't, you, you can fake that for a little bit, but eventually you have to actually have it. It will catch up with you if you don't. Yeah. If <laughs> and you don't and the, have it. the way you build confidence in air traffic is knowing all of the rules that you have to follow like the back of your hand. That's, yeah, that's a great So point. that when you start putting your orchestra wands out there, you know which direction you can go. You know what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say. You cannot be thinking, huh, can I do this? When you need to be doing it. Right. <laughs> that has to be happening. Right. Uh, so as far as, you know, so for that going to Oklahoma, there's really not a lot you can pre-plan for. There's not, there's nothing you're really going to be able to study to have it, you know, to know everything that you need to know before you get there. But when you do get there is, and you get the stuff and they say, Hey, this is the stuff you need to know. That's not just like a suggestion. Or a good idea. You need to know it cold and know it inside out and backwards, upside down. And that will, because you're now you're not convert, you're not having to commit brain power to sifting through these rules. You just know them. Mm -hmm. Cold. Yes. You have to know them. And I'll add one more to that. <laughs> If you are someone who likes to kind of bend the rules and think outside the box and be creative, you can be creative, but you have to be following the rules when you do it. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. There's a lot of people who've done what you're trying to learn how to do before you. They're teaching you the way to do it 
efficiently and safely. Follow what they say. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's super rare for anybody to come in at a place. You know, most of these facilities, there's not, it's not like there's a lot of new facilities. <laughs> okay. They don't just pop up. So, uh, they've been around for a long time. Mm. And this goes back to our conversation about Metroplex. If there was a way for them to do it better, it would have already been happening. Trust me. They mm-hmm. they want it to be as efficient as it possibly can be. They have a vested interest in that. The airlines have an interest in that. I know that the airlines are involved in, it, or at least on the inside of knowing what is happening at Metroplex. And uh, there's really nothing else that can happen, aside from building more runways mm-hmm. or changing where the terminal is. <laughs> They're, they're just under constraint. So, um, yeah, I, there's, you need to know your stuff. Yeah. And don't be afraid to get very constructive and sometimes feedback that will hurt your feelings. That's a great advice. I, I'm, I, I kind of got hung up on, you know, training or advice for people like trying to get into the FA, but th- this is just for trainees in general, I guess. If you're going to get in and you're going to become a trainee, be open to criticism. You cannot get your feelings hurt. You can't. And you you have to understand that criticism of what you're doing on position, especially when you start working live traffic is not to belittle you. It's not to demean you. Um, it's to help make you better. Some, some controllers approaches to that may not be as refined or may be a little more rough, but they mean it just the same. And your ability to take that criticism and one, not shut down, not completely implode on on position is super critical. Um, I don't know if you're, you know, if you're the kind of person where you know that's going to bother you, how you change that in your mind, but you have to. You have to change it in your mind because the guys that... Uh, if you cannot work with a little bit of pressure from a trainer, how can I trust you to work a completely covered up, busy situation? You can't. You can't. We're building trust with you from day one. <laughs> the trust bond, okay? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're trying to make it. Yep. And you're going to have a lot of bad days before you start having a lot of good days. That is another thing that no one told me. This is going to be one of the most miserable times of your life. <laughs> Knowing that going in, I think, is it would be a huge... Yeah. I didn't know. They don't tell you that. No. They don't tell you that. Uh-uh. It's not fun. It's not fun. I liked the challenge of learning something new. It was very challenging. I've done a lot of stuff. I, I've done a lot of things that required a lot of training. And nothing was as difficult as getting certified at this mid-level place in the FAA. Not only the actual work, but mentally. Like, I have years, years ahead of me to get through this. Knowing that is a huge mind battle. Mm. <laughs> now, everybody, not it's not going to take that long everywhere. And we've got our, our you know, process here down whittled down significantly from that. But when we came through, it was years. Mm -hmm. And you had to come back every day after a very bad day. It's one thing to come back from break after a bad session where you just got told, you you are terrible. This isn't (laughs) isn't the right place for you. I don't know what else to tell you. You're not doing what we tell you. And you're probably going to wash out. You're going to hear that. Yes. They're not there to motivate you like... Hey, Every it's going to be day. okay. You're doing yeah. so good. Oh, let me hold your hand. Okay. You know, <laughs> that's not happening. No. And you have to do that day after day for a very long time. 
So toughen up as but the best you can. Don't take things too hard and come back and try it again. Yeah, don't take him personal. <laughs> He's probably going to stop now. He's, yeah, it's before they even start. Like, like, oh my right. gosh, what have I gotten into? <laughs> I've heard enough. I'm done. <laughs> I still think, though, I've thought, I thought a lot about this, um, especially the longer I've been a trainer, the more people I've trained. You know, is it the right approach? Is being hard on these guys the right thing to do? I, I think it is. I think it's the only way that this can be done properly because I... I need to apply a little bit of pressure. I need to put my thumb on you a little bit because that is not even going to be close to what it feels like when you have 15 airplanes on frequency. Mm -hmm. And if you can't function with me pushing your buttons a little bit, I don't think there's really a place for you, you know, on a 15 airplane scope. Very well said. Okay. All right, we do not have a new question of the week. That's it for feedback. We got caught up to just prior to February 12th on this episode. If we missed your email, let us know. We typically respond from the feedback at opposingbases.com address. If your feedback is going to be on the show, we'll tell you when it's going to be on the show so you can make sure to catch that if you're listening out of order. AG, anything to add before we head to the chat room? Uh... All right. Closing out. Episode 272 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Drop. Visit OpposingBases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at OpposingBases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.